wonderful to see you here on um, this beautiful day. Um, I'm Jennifer DeVere Brody. I chair the Department of Theater and Performance Studies here, and I also work in comparative studies of race and ethnicity and in African American studies. And it's just wonderful that you're here for this special talk and celebration of the brand new six month old uh, new Anderson collection. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome our special guest, um, Professor Kelly Jones. And before I tell you a little bit um, about her, in case you don't know, I want to just thank, uh, again, our wonderful sponsors for this celebration, especially the um, curator of the collection, Jason Manitsky, and also Amy Shapiro, uh, both of the Anderson Collection, and Jamie, who's filming today. Uh, I also want to thank the Stanford Arts Institute, particularly Matthew Tews and Emily Seidel, who called for proposals from individual faculty and uh, awarded me one so that I could bring uh, people here for this lovely space. I also want to thank my colleagues and staff, Jen, uh, Patrice O'Dwyer, Janet Panetta, Caitlin Fong, Stephanie Okuda, and Rebecca Ormiston, who's really been instrumental in helping to advertise and make this possible, as well as Shelley Fister Fishkin in American Studies, the Dean of Humanities and Sciences, the Associate Dean Deborah Sachs, uh, Sandy Aldeem of African and African American Studies, and Jose David Salivar of CSRA also lent support. So Dr. Jones is a professor of the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University and one of the nation's foremost authorities on contemporary art in the African diaspora, including Latino and Latina arts and artifacts. She's a stellar curator, a superb writer about visual and other arts, as evident from her awards, such as a grant from the Creative Capital, Warhol Foundation, the Terror Museum of American Art. Uh, she's also been recognized for her curatorial work by Art Forum and the International Association of Art Critics. Dr. Jones's original and brilliant book, I Minded, uh, Living and Writing in Contemporary Art, which came out from Duke University Press. And we'll show you that beautiful, she she loves this purple color, but this gives you a sense of how amazing and um, substantial this book is. And it includes contributions from her illustrious family, Amiri Baraka, Kenny Jones, Lisa Jones, and Guthrie Ramsey, Jr. Uh, and we were having a conversation as we were touring the Anderson Collection, just about that this is also uh, a family collection of art and that through line of thinking about our interlocutors for art and the close associations, especially around multimedia, I think will be evident in her talk and very important to her aesthetic and the way she conceptualizes uh, the arts in general. Okay. Um, as Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, who was here not too long ago in this very podium, also in celebration of the Anderson Collection said, of I Minded, it reveals Kelly Jones as a discerning architect of the multicultural landscape and is informed by her keen eye and incisive intellect. For me, I Minded is a unique book that is a beacon of intergenerational and interdisciplinary artwork. As she writes in the introduction, Art in the Family, appropriately titled, she wants to think about how art objects and the activities around their making and display in exhibitions, homes, and studios, as well as their materiality in life, are integral to forming relationships and kinship among sometimes diverse constituencies. And I think that really does encapsulate the appropriateness for this uh, particular family collection here. Dr. Jones does this in all her work, and I admire her for it. Um, it is both her ethic and aesthetic. In an appropriately glowing review of her show Witness, Art and Civil Rights in the 60s, which ran at the Brooklyn Museum from March 7th through July 13th of last year, and we can only think about how prescient it was, given the events of uh, Ferguson and everything that happened in 2014, and this continues to happen around the um, uh, sort of loss of civil rights and for black subjects in particular. Uh, Isaiah Wooden, a TAP student um, in my department, wrote that Miss, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn challenges the illogics of white supremacy and racial violence. And it is this song that reverberates through Jones's curatorial work to cross the various photos, paintings, sculptures, graphics, music, and videos that are presented in the exhibition, um, which had tons of work and has gotten wonderful work. It was part of the Pacific Standard time as well. Um, that's another piece that she did, now we did, so another piece of her curatorial work in L.A. Um, we're very happy to welcome her back to the West Coast, 
And uh, I also just want to say that she has a new book coming out on conceptual art and Latino art that she's researching right here at Stanford's collection. So it's wonderful to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Jo. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that great introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for bringing me here so I could uh, continue to work in that wonderful archive over at the Green Library. Um, and I'd also uh, like to thank everybody at the Anderson Collection, but also my great family for coming here. A lot of family, and they always, uh, what makes <coughs> my life great in terms of my professional life my family always shows up, so, uh, you know, when you do something that seems arcane like art history, that may not be the case, so I'm always glad uh, to welcome the Greens, and especially I'd like to dedicate this talk to my great aunt, uh, Elise Jones Martin, who's here. So, thank you very much. In 1963, so the story goes, David Hammonds set out from Springfield, Illinois, in his car. When it broke down 25 miles outside of town, he repaired it, but didn't return the few short miles back home. Instead, he kept going, determined at all costs to keep heading west and to his destination of Los Angeles. Hammonds was like many artists heading from the countryside, small town, or regional city to the sprawling metropolis drawn as much to the adventures there as to the locale of culture and avant-garde activity. In the mid-20th century, others of his generation also headed west from the mid-regions of the United States. Bruce Nauman, born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Ed Ruscha, born in Omaha, Nebraska, and Judy Chicago, born in Chicago, all sought to stake a claim in the Los Angeles art game. They studied art and began showing their work there in the early 1960s as the city came into its own as a major cultural capital. What differentiates Hammond's story from these others to a certain degree is its implication in another narrative. It is a tale to be sure of a larger African American community in Los Angeles in the same period. Like Hammond's, Charles White, born in Chicago, John Otterbridge, born Greenfield, North Carolina, Noah Purifoy, born, born Snow Hill, Alabama, and Senga Ngudi, born in Chicago, made their way to California as adults or as children. Those born in Los Angeles, like Betty Saar, were the children of people who had made that same journey. What is significant about this seemingly simple, almost unnoticeable fact, is its tie to the much larger, two-century-long narrative of black migrants. African American migration in the 19th and 20th century was nothing less than black people willing into existence their presence in modern American life. It represents their resolve to make a new world in the aftermath of human bondage and stake their claim in the United States. It is a narrative that stretches 100 years forward from the moment of freedom, a tale with a genesis in southern climes that then moved north and west, and it is a tale of the role of place in that claim particularly the role of the West as a site of possibility, peace, and utopia. Artists such as Hammonds, like most African Americans in the 20th century, were part of this massive relocation of people in some way. My goal here is to understand and demonstrate how their work speaks to the dislocations and cultural reinvention of migration, its materials of loss and of possibility, and sense of reinscription of the new in style and practice. Between 1910 and 1970, more than six and a half million African Americans left the southern United States for points north and west in what has been called the Great Migration, one of the largest and fastest internal migrations in history. Such movement, even when self-propelled, was often not just a one-time or permanent thing. There was the notion of crisscrossing, as the historian Darlene Clark Pine has posited. forward and backward, but not relentless and linear due to factors such as the scrutiny of black movement, lack of capital, the need to care for relatives left behind, and keeping in touch with home. In the notion of crisscross, we find as well Michelle Desertot's notion of ellipsis, 
the gap in spatial continuum, a journey whose synecdochic movements nevertheless comprise the semblance of a whole. In the 20th century, African Americans headed west via car, train, or bus, but in the 19th century, they walked. As Hines rem as Hine reminds us, quote, blacks challenged with their feet the boundaries of freedom. Similarly, de Certeau engaged the figure of the walker, the person on the ground who rearticulates and reinscribes the city state in her own image, a migrational force all but invisible on the city plan outside the panoptic power of the grid. For de Certeau, walking implies the rhetoric of the Pedestrian Speech Act, which appropriates the topographical and offers a rhetoric of alternate social rela relations, connecting positions on the map that are unexpected in the dominant cartographic imagination. The walker is the dreamer in search of her own true and proper form. The walker exits from the prescribed geographic plan and in doing so, reconfigures it, improvising, inventing something new. Black migrations were spatial movements, bodies creating new paths to selfhood and enfranchisement. Migrations then are motion and action. The articulation of new routes away from a feudal past and toward a modern future. As initiated by African Americans, these activities look to find places where people thrive. They are gestures that inscribe a world for emergence, growth, the renovation of self, and a revision of citizenship. These are assertions of space, cultural or political, as land or property, and create place, whether actual sites in the world or positions in global imagination. Yet such affirmative declarations of location are also matched by their inversions. The negative valences of segregation, apartness, constriction, refusal. The history of segregation in the United States was more than juridical restraint. It was the separation of black and white bodies accomplished through physical and spatial acts that enforced partition, imposed division, and rationalized and made real a dysfunctional inequality. As much as migration was spatial claim, segregation was the denial of space, both intellectual and physical. As migrants made their way west, they sought spaces that offered greater freedom. Yet even on the road to the <coughs> utopian frontiers, there continued to be trade-offs, barriers to free will and self-determination. While the West did not have the same histories of black enslavement as did the South, the African-American Westerner remained an ambivalent figure to a certain degree. She was not so much an individual as a representative for the mass and majority a notion that unleashed the white supremacist sphere of a black planet. The public sphere, locations of labor, educational settings, and housing were some of the arenas that continued as nodes of friction to full engagement of black citizenry, even in California and the paradise of black Los Angeles. Such examples show us how the uneven, asymmetrical, or patently malicious and unjust application of spatial logic informed experience and expression. Spatial theory in the writings of geographers, philosophers, architects, historians, and art historians help us see migration and segregation not just as arenas of social and historical movement and juridical challenge, but as the articulation of spatial structure, what Henri Lefebvre has called social space. Through it, we can see and understand how people shape their world, worlds through creative force. The question for us here is how do artists translate the same experiences into form? What do they make of this world? How do they tr transform what they find into what they would like it to be? How, in the words of Elizabeth Gross, do these things become the measure of life's actions upon them? How does art speak in the spatial world that artists and others create of their lives? And how is the spatial imperative seen in life's physical peregrinations and directions found in this compromise between mind and matter the point of their crossing one into the other that place represents. According to Levev, social space is a social product. It is at once a field of action and a basis of action, quantitative in its expanses and qualitative as a depth of thought, material in its physical articulation and material in the work that it does. Social space is the inner penetration of real space as a material thing with space as mental construct and philosophical iteration. 
If for the Fed space is a container of social relationships, art historian Miwang Fan sees the space in the site specificity of specificity of art of the late 20th century as constructed of divergent forms, both material and immaterial. For Plan, the site is simultaneously phenomenological, a physical iteration of practice, and social and institutional in its conscription of bodies and imprecation and structures such as museums. However, it is Plan's sense of site as discursive formation that is perhaps most intriguing, and like the Feb social space, threads itself through all types of spaces, concrete, material, as well as those of memory. Here, the notion of sight shuttles between that of a physical location, grounded, fixed, actual, to a vector that is ungrounded, fluid, virtual. Catherine McKittrick offers another significant and related framing of spatial thought, that of the socio-spatial. If all, all, sorry, if all knowledges are geographic, she argues, then positionality is geography. In other words, what do you know, and from where do you know it? McKittrick thinks about black geographies and bodily ownership. She considers the history of black people demarcated by discourses of possession and captivity of the flesh, occasioned by its attachment to the material fragment of the auction block. Because the black body historically is an object owned rather than a subject that possesses, it is ungeographic. Black is rather a concept that is cast as a momentary evidence of the violence of abstract space, an interruption in transparent space, a different all-body answer to otherwise undifferentiated geographies. McKittrick's project is the consideration of respatialization of black as body, as form, as geography, and ongoing mapping as a site of contestation and complexity, rather than dispossession or peripheral schema. It is located within and outside of traditional space, elucid elucidates black social particularities and knowledges from a spatial perspective, and ultimately offers a new and expanded understanding of moment space. Between 1960 and 1980, the art scene in Los Angeles generally, and certainly among African American artists, became a vibrant, engaged, and activist community. Works tied to traditional media, painting, drawing, print, sculpture, gave way to dematerialized post-minimal installation and body-centered performance. Within these styles and formats were spatial ideas that changed how artists accessed and incorporated notions of history and virtuality, the real and the imagined. While these ideas were present throughout the period and used to varying degrees, Earlier works, not surprisingly, evidence of greater interest in history and didactic formulas, with later production moving toward the abstract and ephemeral. Made from Chinese ink on illustration board, Charles White's General Moses Harriet Tubman from 1965 is a portrait of this important slave absconder, conductor on the Underground Railroad, abolitionist, and Union spy during the Civil War. In White's four by five foot drawing, Tubman, the composition center of gravity, sits on a boulder as if taking a brief rest from the task at hand. She stares out at us with a direct, relentless gaze. The artist takes on history, Afri history, American, African American, and also diasporic, in a commentary on transatlantic slavery. In fact, White's mode in the 20 years prior to this work was in the social realist vein representing and repositioning African-American figures as subjects of accomplishment rather than the inhuman and unhistorical empty vessel that the label of slave suggested. Centered on a solid rock, Tubman's geographic presence belies the attachment to the perch of the auction block. The drawing was created the year the Voting Rights Act was passed, which dismantled impediments to black enfranchisement in many parts of the United States. The 1965 Act and White's Peace both marked the centennial of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. Taken together with its realist mode, the didactic and pedagogical nature of the work seems evident. This is one of my favorite photographs. <laughs> Charles White's career brought him to Los Angeles in 1956 after he made a name for himself in his hometown of Chicago as well as New York. 
He came to the city with an international reputation, one that made him one of the most important African-American artists up to that period. The public profile of California black artists in the 1950s was largely defined by their commercial work. William Pazio designed men's ties. Betty Brown, later Sarr, and Curtis Tan ran a successful jewelry and decorative arts business, Brown and Tan. There they are. <laughs> Melvin Edwards worked with ceramicist and home accessories designer Tony Hill. White was part of a generation that willed an African-American art community into existence with little traditional art world support, mounting exhibitions in homes, community centers, churches, and black-owned businesses cutting a path for the emergence of a cadre of professional artists. His mentorship of younger artists would prove to be a catalytic force, helping to sustain a vibrant black art scene in the city, especially after he began teaching at Otis Art Institute in 1965. Trained in interior and furniture design and fine arts at Chouinard Art Institute, Noah Purifoy also held a master's degree in social work. And from the 1950s into the early 60s, he worked at hospitals and social service agencies and in the commercial art sector. He began his career as a cultural worker, however, as the director of the Watts Towers Art Center. Newly designated as a cultural heritage monument in 1963, the Watts Towers began to be developed as a cultural hub as a way to engage the community, attract attention, and support the project of its preservation. Its mission would be to address problem youth by using the arts as a tool of cultural uplift, which at once demonstrated art's value and the good works that Watts Towers itself could perform. Purifoy had the perfect credentials for the job and it allowed him to define his interest in art and social work. The Watts Rebellion of 1965 occurred a year into Purifoy's tenure as director of the Watts Towers Art Center and some four blocks away. He contended it was the rebellion that really made him an artist allowing him to find meaning for himself and for African-American communities through art making. As Purfoy remembered, he experienced the rebellion, the destruction, the looting from the back door of the center. He and colleague Judson Powell, while the debris was still smoldering, ventured into the rubble like other junkers of the community, digging and searching, but unlike others, obsessed without quite knowing why. By September, working during lunchtime and after teaching hours, he had collected three tons of charred wood and fired molded in the grief. While Purifoy recorded some of his earliest work as a collage, he was eventually drawn to assemblage, or assemblage as I like to say many times, <laughs> because of the accessibility and, and availability of materials because it was made from discarded things. In his eyes, such junk was democratic. It didn't discriminate against those with fewer advantage or access to art materials because it was free. Assemblage also had a relationship to narratives of poverty and reflected communities <coughs> ravaged by a social system that cared little for them. The rebellion and its remnants could be turned into not only something of beauty, but something of African American life. Here was the transformative aspects of Purifoy's, aspect of Purifoy's practice a way to transfigure the perception of one's living space, use what was available, and create something meaningful and beautiful. For Purifoy, the found object also represented a useful tool in mental health practices. It was a method to address trauma, a simple solution that black or poor people could use. Using his own experience as a voracious reader, in the early 50s, while working as a social worker in Cleveland, he tried using what he called bibliotherapy, giving books to the mentally disturbed as a tool in their healing. With art, he found more success. Purifoy's use of art as a tool of psychotherapy, a way to re reintegrate the mind and body, mirrors that of Ligia Clark of Brazil, whose object making also led her to a similar practice during roughly the same period. In spring 1966, Purifoy launched the exhibition 66 Signs of Neon, composed of junk art from the Watts Rebellion. It toured the country through 1969. Its goal was to communicate the human potential of Watts to the neighborhood itself and the world. As Purifoy explained, the show's purpose, uh, quote, was to reflect the Watts Rebellion on a symbolic level and to demonstrate to the community an existing fact. 
If the community of Watts found itself in the midst of something, something like junk, value could be placed on it to far exceed the few cents paid at the junk stores on Monday. John Unabridge's growing consideration of arts instrumentality and social function was encouraged by Pur Purifoy's rhetoric and example. He began to think how art and culture could effectively participate to help build a community, break, exist break existing molds, and create an interest in social change. Artists were challenged to think among themselves in new ways. For Unabridge, art with social commentary also evolved naturally in the climate of the times. It was indeed part of the aesthetic assemblage, quote, how you use whatever is available to you, and what is available to you is not merely, not mere material, but the material and the essence of the political climate, the material in the degree of social issues. Catalyzed by the times, Otterbridge came to think of himself as an activist artist whose studio was everywhere. Like Purifoy, Utterbridge took on the role of cultural worker, directing the Compton Communicative Arts Academy, CCCA, between 1969 and 1975. Two decades later, Utterbridge acknowledged that CCAA, no, CCAA, <laughs> I said it the first time, itself became his environmental piece, installation and process. His work as an artist was, in a sense, creating a space for others to grow creatively. Indeed, some of the structures built within CCAA were created from some of the same materials and in the same manner that Otterbridge used in his individual but small-scale work. It was the aesthetics of making do with little, with the found and discarded. Ray Gundecker and Judith McWillie have identified dressed or work yards, actual and symbolic landscapes, where things are thoughts, where intellectual and, and spiritual concepts are given visible, visibility and corporeality. These yards were both protective and protected. They were spaces that were cared for, looked after, cultivated, guarded. In the social landscape of the 20th century, ripe with the inequities of segregation, discrimination, and inequities of racial power, these domestic sites ascribe a certain personal control to their owners. They turn the lurking uncertainties of dispossession into something mutable and contained, and converted them into something of beauty and bounty. John Otterbridge recalls similar practices in and around his North Carolina childhood home, an interior wallpapered with newspaper, his father's French horn given pride of place on a wall when it was not in use, window shades adorned with paintings. Then there were things that hung on the door on fences. Groups of dried boards lifted on poles topped with a bit of rag placed in gardens to scare away predators. His father's accumulations of old stuff found in all manner of places and kept around the house and in the backyard. Indeed, the son nominated his father a jumpster because his livelihood was hauling away and often recycling and transforming old stuff. The terms old stuff or junk, as Gundecker points out, can be read both as a reason for the dismissal of these actions as based in poverty and lack, but also as phrases of indirection and multivalence taken up by African American yard workers. Like the word antique, these expressions suggest ancientness, a time of ancestors, as in that old slave time jump, and a certain marginality. Outbridge was, has suggested that his use of belts, fasteners, and bindings in his containment series, and his rejection of the painted surface for metal as refutations of traditional formulas of art making, as well as a co commentary on the larger social constraints and boundaries faced by African Americans historically. Interestingly, his work is not really too far from the tying and wrapping that Gundecker and McWillie describe, an action that seals intentions and which they trace back to Central Africa. Applied to objects, thresholds, and fences, tying and wrapping secure the area, the charm, and the power, and activate these things in the home and the very landscape itself. 
In a work such as Let Us Tie Down Loose Ends, Otterbridge thus not only stated his position formally as an artist and socially as an African American, but bound and locked in their power. By sealing the piece with leather straps, he ensured the effectiveness and value of this object in the world. His narrative, in which binding also inscribes its opposite, the will to break down boundaries, mirrored the ambivalence or oscillation of power that can be used for healing as well as harmful ends, as seen in his work Southern and African Predecessors. When Otterbridge put together Case in Point around 1970, part of his Ragman series, its Belize-like shape, leather casing, and legend, packages <coughs> travel like people, evoked African-American migration narratives, as well as changing ideas of sculpture in late 20th century Western practice. However, if the leather straps appear simply as a function of the transport of the package, we can now see them as having specific aesthetic value, the wrapping and tying of intention, a pledge of safety on route and in one's new world. Through this figure of Hammonds, we can perfect, uh, through the figure of Hammonds, we can perhaps most clearly chart the evolving visual aesthetics <coughs> of this community of African American artists in California. His teacher Charles White's influence can be seen in Hammonds' early choice of the graphic medium as well as in his work political content. There is an instrumental approach to storytelling, communication, and meaning. In pieces, in pieces such as Boy with Flag, 1968, a combination of silkscreen and body print technologies, a young man stands behind the U.S. standard emerging from its shadows, yet still seemingly bifurcated by its cutting edges which appear to slice through the body. The piece also refers to history and its implications of unequal treatment under the law, ideas of exclusion and African Americans as three quarters human, as suggested by the partial portrait. The materials that Hammonds took up in the 1970s were free and easily available in the mode of assemblages such as Purifoy, but they were also mobile and migratory. Part of their importance lay in the temporary and ephemeral nature and siding in places that assured their disappearance over time. We see this in Hammonds' work with hair. He planted temporary and ephemeral hair gardens in outdoor locales in the damp sand along the shores of Southern California beaches. They were saltwater grasses, somehow hybrid cattails, familiar yet out of place, too close to the water's edge, strangely shaped yet seemed to bend in the ocean breeze. These gardens also took root inside, suspended from wires and rubber bands, walls and ceiling. These appear not just on the west coast, but in the southwest and the east, as if the spores had flown throughout the country, making an apparent reverse migration along the routes black people had traveled earlier in the century. The substance could play a decorative role as a subtle accent adorning Hammond's greasy bag art as in Bag Lady in Flight. Another piece, Flight Fantasy from 1978, is a huge work that hugs the wall, extending outward from a center that is at once mass and body. It encompasses two huge wing formations where hair and fragments of vinyl records threaded on reeds bending from the weight turn in a horizontal orientation and seem about to take flight. For Hammonds, grease and hair were both objects with African-American signification, though non objective in form. As he would later comment about hair, quote, I got a visual object and, and a medium that were pure and non-sexual, which stood to everything I wanted to say. Spatial theory becomes a hinge, a way to think about works like Hammonds and his relationship to how African-American migrants thought about and named places and spaces, about the importance of place to those who don't have one or are always searching for one, those who are patently ungeographic, as McKittrick indicates. We can consider further the role of the imaginary expressive cultural in that search, the need to imagine someplace beautiful and amazing on a daily basis. As Plon suggests, the persistent adherence to the actuality of places in memory and longing is perhaps a means of survival. 
The move from didactic works to those of greater abstraction by these African-American artists of Los Angeles <laughs> was a move from historical to virtual content, from the consideration of the past, even if the immediate past, to the imagining of the future. Yet the acts of respatialization of dominant knowledge, both artistic and geographic, in real time and psychic space, in many ways continue to respatialize the past and present, as well as the future. This occurs through a presence that is ancestral, a form that moves from the past into the future that may appear as a physical trace in style, remains, sound, and spatial techniques. A metaphoric trace, a utopian form. While this ancestral aspect is similar to that discussed by Faraday and Griffin as a protective, if at times unheeded, spatial cultural sign, its temporal aspect in the range across time brings us toward a model of Afrofuturism. This model, as Alondra Nelson explains, uses the past to explain the present and prophesies the future. Time and space are not linear. Technologies are not always new, but lean on past anachronistic technoculture as antenna of the future. And as such, our African-American voices with other stories to tell about culture, technology, and things to come. Works by Hammonds and others look to the past and think to the future through modes that are historical and futuristic. In one way, their works are modern migration narratives. However, unlike earlier models, models described by Griffin, they embody this aspect in their material fracture and, and intellectual positioning, a pursuit of African diasporic cultural form. During the 1970s, artists like Hammonds and Sangam and Goody began to experiment with post-minimal ephemerality and performance, moving away from a pedagogic approach to subject matter connected to civil rights and black power and toward more non-objective, dematerialized and conceptual modes. In effect, they were re-spatializing and remapping the city through the performative body. Their bodies were in motion, not still, not the immovable property that made the black body an object under slavery. Post-minimalist installation was heterotopic, the space of the habitus, evincing intersecting layers of the social and the built. Spaces of celebration and resistance, enacting black geographies and performing ownership of self. These artists use space and the city as a measure of the body. Second and Goody's first full length of performance took place in 1978. Ceremony for Freeway Fets was a public art project supported by a CETA grant and sponsored by the Black on Rockman Gallery along with Caltrans, the Los Angeles transportation system. The one-time event took place under a section of the freeway near the convention center. A small orchestra composed of students and artists played saxophone, flute, drums, and other less traditional instruments. Nearly all participants were equipped with the form of Mangudi sculpture. Mangudi, Hammonds, and Mara Hassinger provided the work's major movement and most elaborate wearable art. Ceremony for Freeway Fets shares certain aesthetic conventions with West African masquerade. For instance, there is a crew of masked performers, some in full body gear. Nanguti's version of her wearable sculpture culminates in a crown that appears to be placed on top of the head, calling to mind the elaborate wooden superstructures found in Nigerian Gelide masquerades, among others. In many African productions, the actual faces of the performers are covered with mesh or folds of fabric. The object that spins in Nanguri's hand finds a comfortable analogy in the fly wisps and other items often carried by African masqueraders. So you can see, you know, the kind of how the face coverings um, here uh, over Hammonds' face, Mary Hassinger in the middle, and also Nanguri, kind of particularly with Hassinger, uh, kind of really linked up with this one here with Gelly. Um, masker, and here's the fly whisk in uh, the masker's hand here, and here you can see in these uh, pantyhose and sand fly whisk. <laughs> so you can see how this formally it links up. Galilee masquerades, and, and also, you know, just want to point out also the uses of the fabric in the kind of body costume as well. 
Uh, Galilee masquerades pay homage to and appease female power. Traditional Yoruba societies are patrilineal, yet women are seen as having great metaphysical power, on par sometimes even greater than that of deities. As with many African masking traditions, Galilee is a way to maintain harmony in the society's social dynamics or village structure. Nanguti's own costume, in particular, shares more in common with another type of Yoruba masquerade form called Egungu. And you can see here uh, with the Egungu, um, yeah, the kind of fabric body you have here, the fabric here of the costume. And you know, there's no um, kind of wooden carapace here. Uh, as you can see with the Gelade, it's all fabric. The people are, the masters are looking through that kind of black and white striped area. You see this little top knot. So you can also see how that relates to um, her costume as well. The Gungu masquerades celebrate the ancestors and regulate relations between the living and the dead. As John Pemberton has noted, ancestors are present in all human affairs of the Europe. They are always hovering on the edges of earthly life, communicating through dreams and divination and masquerade. And as Zoe Strother has wonderfully suggested about Pende, Central African masking traditions, quote, as a church constitutes an agreed upon site of contact for Christians between the physical and metaphysical realms, so the masks create a liminal space in which the worlds of the living and the dead may be superimposed. The masks presence reminds the living of the invisible family members dancing alongside. Indeed, as Marin Hassinger has recounted about her participation in ceremony for freeway fets, um, there was something incredibly African about it, a kind of timing with lulls and surprise bursts of energy that she associated with West African dance and theatrical tradition. For Nanguti, the cloistered space underneath the freeway had a rural feel. With its few trees and transients, in her mind, she conjured an African village. This image of the Ubuntu masquerader appeared in, um, sorry. this image of the Ubuntu masquerader, that too, <laughs> uh, on the right, appeared in the magazine African Arts in April 1978, published out of the University, University of California, Los Angeles. Nanguti's performance took place the same year, again in March, thus discounting her direct influence by this particular example. The exhibition African Art in Motion was curated by Robert Ferris Thompson for White Art Gallery of UCLA in 1974. Though Nanguti was living in New York at that time, she may have been inspired by another version of the Boom Boom Regalia seen in the show's catalog and the spinning image at the right. And this was the image from that catalog. It was another of the Boom Masquerade. And then there was Japan. Curiosity about Asian art and philosophy eventually led Nanguti to Japan. She spent 1966 and 67 in Tokyo, where she studied at Waseda University in the interval between her undergraduate and graduate years at California State University, Los Angeles. She was particularly fascinated with the work of the Butai Art Association, whose unorthodox objects and exhibitions would provide important models. Formed in 1954 in the Kansai region, Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto. During the mid to late 50s, Butai experimented with materials such as mud, water, fabric, and air, as well as the incorporation of time in exhibitions that were held outdoors, in theaters, as well as in traditional exhibition spaces. Butai is generally translated into English as embodiment, and it is this sense of the work with artists involving their bodies in art making that attracted Nanguti. For his many screens of paper of 1956, for instance, Saburo Murakami literally made action paintings by crashing through parallel canvases of brown paper. The resulting tears were the mark making. But if Murakami's works are among the most iconic in the West, it is the formal structure of pieces by others, 
such as Asusupo Tanaka, that may have had an even greater impact on him. Tanaka's electric dress of 1956, a wearable artwork from common light bulbs and neon tubes, is an example. As worn by Tanaka, it is an encumbrance with the artist literally wired up and stationed at the power source. Mengudi's 1976 piece encasing Mary Hassinger and mooring her to the wall surface comes to mind. And you can see the comparisons there. In Japan, Nanguti broadened her knowledge of Japanese theatrical traditions, becoming more familiar with no kabuki and buto, and taking private art and dance classes. At the roots of these forms was shamanic trance, which was performative, public, and provided dramatic structure. Low dancing with the orientation of the hips to the ground and crouching positions are valued in no performance, as well as much traditional Japanese dance characteristics shared with African custom. No's use of masks is also significant, for while these shows have no directors, a mask <coughs> will suggest how the roles should be enacted. The rest of the costume follows, and of great importance here is an elongated sleeve which accentuates the expression of the dance. We can certainly connect this with Nanguri's flowing robe in ceremony for freeway fets. Perhaps the most fascinating link between Nanguni's performance and that of ancient Japan is the act of performing while holding objects in one's hand, seen in Nanguni's grafts of her pantyhose sculpture as well as Hammond's building of his staff. The fan is an omnipresent prop in traditional Japanese theater arts because of its link to shamanic tradition. As an object, it replaced the sacred branch or spear, the place the deity inhabited during ritual trance. As a number of scholars have shown us, Asia and Asia America have been important to African American understandings and workings of discursive notions of race. On the West Coast in particular, this multiculture was not only local and national, but recognizably part of a larger international community, thus contributing to the sense of race in a broader world. Historically, we can point to the parallelisms of forced labor of African Americans and indentured servitude of Chinese and Indians in the Americas of the 19th century. In 20th century Los Angeles, Japan and Japanese American culture present a similar coefficient profile. Like African American migrants to 20th century Los Angeles, we find the importance of the role of secondary migration with Japanese moving to Hawaii and other parts of California before heading to Los Angeles. African American and Japanese and eventually Japanese Americans lived in close proximity, proximity in the inner cities. African Americans were soldiers in wars with Asia, beginning in Japan but extending Korea, where Noah Purifoy and John Otterbridge served, China, Vietnam, Hanoi, and Laos. Along the West Coast, African Americans inherited Japanese neighborhoods empty, neighborhoods empty by internment. <coughs> there is South Asian support of anti-colonial struggles, struggles after 1947 and the ban on conference of non-aligned nations in 1955 that also demonstrate Afro-Asian connections as sites of parallel history and mutual support. Along with the emergence of independent African countries, China comes into view as a world power. Vietnam's struggle for self-determination were inspirations to a generation of U.S. citizens supporting anti-war and third world liberation movements. If Asia is a signpost for African American freedom dreaming in the 20th century, groups like the Black Panthers, themselves inspired by Chinese communism, stimulated the U.S. multicultural left and the formation of groups such as the Young Lords, the Brown Berets, the Red Guard Party, and Students for a Democratic Society. Much was shared there in the will to re release oneself from the stranglehold of European social, political, and aesthetic power. In this context, it was not surprising that Asia and Asia America would form an integral part of Nanguti's aesthetic constellation. Nanguti's Afro-Asian experimentations seem more possible in the Western United States. With its Pacific coast facing the whole of Asia, California had a substantial history of embracing Asian aesthetics, certainly in ceramics and paintings from uh, 
Sergeant Johnson and Ken Price to John McLaughlin. Nanguti thus followed a West Coast tradition. In the example of Nanguti and others here, we see people of African descent actively transforming racial meanings to produce new subjectivities in the cultural sphere. We witness the impact of migrations and globalization and the factor of mobility where racial ethnic belonging becomes dislodged from place. This is enunciated first in these subjects' arrival in California with the intention of creating new lives and subjectivity, second in the artist's fashioning of increasingly abstract and dematerialized creative structures that nevertheless want to continue to articulate racial knowledge, and third in the expansion of racial meaning through global aesthetics of African and then Asian forms. But while Asian aesthetics signify the global, in California, they are very much local as well. By 1980, a number of artists like Hammonds, who had made Los Angeles an art capital, had relocated to New York. Most certainly, the presence of these practitioners on the East Coast affected the city's expanding discourse in the 1980s and beyond in terms of visual and cultural diversity. However, it was their experience in Los Angeles that first contextualized their work in the global continuum, the space their diasporic turn ultimately led. Place in the work of these artists considered here and the spatial formations used to elucidate it signal desires both to think about the future and to reconsider and reframe the past. In effect, these two positions become interchangeable, as Elizabeth Gross suggests in a, quote, reciprocal interaction between the virtual and the real, an undecidable reversibility, as if the image could take the place of an object and force the object behind the constraints of the merest plane. The real is converted into a different order, transformed through the concept of the virtual, iterations of an endless openness or future. Space is real and imagined, as discursive offers this spectrum of positions, a respatialization of the black geographic across the past, present, and future in spaces that are psychic and imaginary as well as real. Art represents new creative and life forms that assert new geographic formulations and new spatial and global demands. Thank you. No, they're only slides. They're only slides. Mm -hmm. 
there were people in video was expensive in 1978 for these people. They were they were making art out of junky stuff. Nobody was going to buy it. They weren't making any money. Um, somebody took some slides. Uh, I'm happy to say though that now they're all doing really well. Sandy and Judy just had a big show in um, London. Uh, David Hammonds is of course the most well-known African American artist. Uh, makes the most money. <laughs> uh, many African American artists living or dead, probably. Um, and good for him because he's still living. No, Basquiat makes more money than him. But he's, uh, you know, alive to see his uh, star shine. And Aaron Hassinger has an exhibition that just opened and will be traveling. Um, it's opened at Spelman College in Atlanta. So she's just had a big retrospect. So a lot of people are. Catching on to these people. It's the one on the right. That's like a Japanese screen, you know, that you see very often. But the context is that like a break in the middle? Or it or is a screen to hold. It, it's not a screen. It's a scroll that it's hangs on the wall. Scroll. Thank you. In the middle here is actually a um, a textured area made from African American hair or from black hair. And it's called Afro Asian Eclipse because he's thinking about uh, Japanese scroll, maybe even Tibetan scrolls, tankas as they're called. But um, there is, for some of you who may know Judge Ellington, he has a song called Afro Eurasian Eclipse. And so I think that David Hammond's all, he's inspired by music a lot, and uh, you can listen to that. <laughs> um, so that's also where he got it from. Yes. Could you speak a little bit about the uh, exhibition, now I dig this, and your role and participation, and how that fits in the context of what you were addressing okay, today? Sure, thank you. Yes, now I dig this was an exhibition that I curated for the Hammer Museum at UCLA. Uh, it opened in 2011. It was part of Pacific Standard Time, which was a big, um, bunch of exhibitions, a large program of uh, 60 to 70 exhibitions that the Getty uh, Research Institute funded to um, basically explore the art of Southern California. They're doing a new one, I think in 17, called LA, LA, which is about the relationship of LA to Latin America. Um, this piece was actually in my show, Now Did This. Uh, it focused on, uh, it was called Now Did This, um, Art in Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980. So it focused on a number of African American artists uh, in that area, um, in that area, in that era, including Sandy Moody, Marin Hassinger, David Hammonds, Charles White. Most of the people actually that I just talked about were in the show. Um, also in the show, though, were other artists, white artists, Latino artists, Asian artists, and uh, that was. Uh, funny because, well, you know, I used the term black, so people thought the show was just going to be black artists, but I talked about black Los Angeles, and it was really about how African American artists and culture had influenced uh, the city of Los Angeles uh, and the world. So uh, we had people, uh, and I was really intent on creating a, or beginning a dialogue about a kind of broader history of Los Angeles. So for instance, there's an artist in the show, uh, African-American artist Daniel LaRue Johnson, and uh, he's an African-American artist. His wife, however, is Chicana, uh, Virginia Jaramillo. So, you know, I didn't want, you know, I want to stop the idea of, okay, we can only talk about him in this, but even though they've been married for 50 years, I can't talk about her, even though they've been artists working together for all this time. Um, but part of the controversy came in that I continued to use the word black and it made some people who weren't black seem to be black, so that seemed to be <laughs> <laughs> It was fun. I had a lot of fun with that. And of course, my lovely family was there to experience it, including my Anna Lakes. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, part of uh, about the show. And you, uh, yes? Um, yeah, um, thank you for the talk. It was really enjoyable. Um, I just I'm curious if you've uh, done any research linking the assemblage pieces, uh, uh, specifically like the one in the backyard, to altars? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean the um, the vernacular artists like this? Yeah, not the, the slide before. <laughs> before. Before. Oh, where they're right. sitting in the back. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, I'm, I'm not really working on these people per se, but if you read uh, the book uh, by Greg Gundiker, Judith McWillie, um, 
I'm not going to forget the title of the book, but they do talk about that. Um, it's a fascinating book because they isolate different aspects of the landscape, wheels, water, different things. Um, they are, they include ideas of spirituality, but I think most of the people who would create this would call themselves Christians. So they wouldn't see this as an altar, right? They would say, no, we're going to church. We're going to talk to Jesus and God and everybody in church. But they do something that also has spiritual ideas here. So in this case, but then, you know, there's a whole other tradition of, uh, you know, if you want to think about, there's also Chicano altars, which are more about a kind of more traditional Christian spirituality that are home altars. They're not so much outside, although some other research and somebody else who knows that more will know a little bit more about that. But, but the home yard includes all this idea of spirituality, power. Um, it's really a fascinating um, area, and there are a number of books on that. Take one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Since oh, I was wondering, are you working? What are you working on now? Are you doing another show? Or I know you just announced it. Yes. Uh, no shows. No shows. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been saying. I know about it. I'll never do a show, and then I show up in the middle. Um, but I'm just trying to finish uh, a couple of books, projects. This talk is actually from a book that's coming out soon about California. I was working on the book when um, I was in Los Angeles doing some research, and uh, a friend of mine who's a curator, uh, then at the Hammer, chief curator, saw me and he says, oh, what are you working on? And I said, oh, I'm working on a book on African-American artists in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s. And he said, oh, are you going to turn that into a show? He said, oh, I'm going to finish the book first. <laughs> and he called me up two weeks later and he says, oh, is your book finished? Because I have this opportunity. <laughs> so, I, you know, it was a great opportunity to work with Getty, to bring a lot more resources to my project, and to give them to the artist, too. Uh, so I did it, and uh, so that book still uh, is coming out, uh, which is on California, but the project that I'm working on here at the Great Archives at Green Library uh, is a book on conceptual art um, in Mexico, well, among Mexican artists and among African American artists, and some of them are in different places, some of the Mexican artists go to London, um, but it's uh, kind of looking at that, so it's more but some of these same players will be in it. Uh, probably David Hammonds will make an appearance. But as I was telling Jennifer, being here and looking at the archives, I'm, I'm shifting it more towards being a Latin American, more focused on Latin America. And you had another question. Yeah. If, can you go to the last slide? The, oh, the last slide. Yeah. The, uh, there you go. Yeah. Which, which one? This one. This one. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, because you said you couldn't video it, that that was a dance? Yes. Is it reproducible? I mean, do they have any choreographic sort of notation so that the person, I mean, the costume could probably be worn again. I mean, that still exists, right? It's from 1978. We got 1978. But let me just say, let me just say, these were artists working with ephemeral materials. Uh, there are two things going on. Pantyhose and sand don't last forever. When I, these were two artists that were now doing this. Marion Hassinger singing movie. I called them up. I said, great, I want to put you in this show. I want some work. And they're like, okay. So he said, pantyhose and land, sand don't last for 40 years. So, okay. I said, okay, I'm going to have permission to make new works. And who knows where that yellow ended up. Marion Hassinger makes big steel works. And I said, where are your works? And she said, you think I'm going to drag that stuff around for 40 years? And I'm lost along the way in various okay. storage okay. spaces and so on, and goes other places. So sometimes artists don't keep up with their stuff, especially if they're not being, quote unquote, successful. If nobody wants it, how are they going to keep 40 years of stuff? Um, sometimes when they become well known, all of a sudden these things appear again. What is the head then? I mean, it looks like an assemblage of textures and fabrics and various things that are hanging down and coming out. I mean, do you know what? It's pantyhose and sand. All, so all of it. Yep, that's oh, really? it. That, so that, yes. And dress as well. It's, okay. it's made of pantyhose and sand. There is a video. Uh, it's called Shopping Bags, 
spirits and freeway fetishes. I believe it's from 1979. It's by filmmaker Barbara McCullough. And she actually did a film that chronicles some of these artists at this time period. And um, she has, there's no video, but she has some of the slides um, you know, in, in the video itself. But what she does have, uh, there's a shot of when she's interviewing Sangin and Goody, Sangin and Goody is actually wrapping her head, or it's wrapped and then she unwraps it uh, with this kind of form. So I'm going to actually see her doing that in, in that particular video. Because that looks fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you have um, done any research with Martin for your particular, as you know, we have two pieces upstairs. I was wondering if you see any direct, like you made here, any direct relationship between African art and what he's doing, particularly in Dom Lock, if you mm -hmm. have any, you know, that you can share with us. Well, I did write about him, and I did show his work in Sao Paulo <coughs> in 1989. So <coughs> in, um, including, I should add, leather that's upstairs, mm -hmm. for example. Yes. So he did work in Sierra Leone in Peace Corps, mm -hmm. so that is where his influence, you can find his influence, but he also is very specific that he wasn't working with carvers, like traditional African carvers, right? He's working in furniture and other things like that. Um, but he would also be the first to tell you, you know, um, that he worked also in was it Scandinavia or where he also went to school. So he has a variety of influences. I wouldn't say that it was directly about Africa. These people at this moment, and, and as you can see from the talk, Africa is there, but Africa also gets pushed aside by Japan. You know, so just to say there's a one, you know, people want to say, oh yeah, there's black people in Africa, that's what they do. No, you know, they actually, first of all, it's not in their blood, and second of all, you know, because that's what people say, oh, it's in their blood, do you remember this? No. They actually <laughs> saw a show, they said, hey, that looks good. Um, and they also, it's the 70s, right? And so people are interested in thinking about their relationship to Africa and, and what that is about. So I think there's, there's many, there's always many things going on in these works. Um, but again, Courier would tell you, if he was standing up here, he would tell you that he's got a lot of stuff going on, and Africa's just one of the many things. Professor Joan, thank you so much for your talk. Um, this is kind of taking a different track in terms of speaking of Afrofuturism. I was wondering um, if you could discuss race and space and perhaps disembodiment are not represented in space and outer space in the future. Um, have you seen that in African American visual culture or perhaps how those narratives are countered and challenged? Um, well, of course, there was a big Afrofuture show as to the movie in so that's the place where you can see that. Um, you know, specific artists. Um, but I'd also, you know, and then there's the sonic, right? Because there's, I think the Studio Museum Harlem show was, um, you know, very much visual based. Some people criticized it because it didn't have enough music in it. But of course, you know, there's always the George Clinton's, the, you know, Sun Ra's and, and all of the kind of funk aesthetic that shows up in, in many ways as, as Afrofuturism. Um, another great person who um, works in that vein, I think, is Ralph Lemon, the dancer. And the project that he did, uh, was it called Some Street Day? Um, anyway, the project that was at Studio Museum that uh, was curated by Thomas Lax, where he did a, a show uh, of photographs. And also there, there's a video where he works with a man named Walter in, I forgot what part of the South, where this man is basically, you know, like some of these, you know, self-taught artists making yards, uh, making, he was making a spaceship on his own. So it's a fantastic piece. It's a, just such a moving video if you get a chance to see that. Um, just moving, uh, because, you know, Ralph Lemon is a dancer, he had a company, um, he disbanded the company, but then what he started to do was do these kind of private performances just for himself that he documented. So he had this friendship with this man named Walter. He would go and, 
they would do these performances and just do them, and then that would be it. And he'd, he'd do things like this, so it was kind of these like, kind of bound dances without a company, and um, just an amazing aesthetic. So I would, you know, that particular piece, I wouldn't say all of Ralph Lemon's work is about that, but actually aspects of it are. So you can find that in a, in a lot of people. I mean, Afrofuturism is everywhere. Right. Yes. Who are some of the more contemporary black artists that you'd be looking at now that are maybe influenced um, by the work that you just talked about? Okay. Um, and I just uh, forgot her name. It just flew out of my flew out of my uh, Abigail. Um, You know, everybody's influenced by David Hemmings. It's not just black people, by the way. You can go to Europe, everybody will tell you they're influenced by David Hemmings. <laughs> so I think David Hammonds, for instance, has influenced the whole world, you know, since the 90s when people started to kind of discover him, and really since the 2000s. Um, you know, there's so many great people working today, though. You know, Lugeshi Mutu, Julia Morentu. I'm not saying they would necessarily be inspired by this. Um, they're just, Stan, actually, Sanford Biggers, for me, is somebody who would, uh, who really brings this tradition forward. He's a performer. Um, he's not necessarily working with sound stuff, but he works just in a variety of ways. He's a musician. Um, and he's also from LA, and he also, what he also does, is he brings in a kind of Asian influence into his work. So especially his early work is really, really um, influenced by, he lived in Japan for a year and did a number of works in Japan. And so they kind of link these Japanese and, uh, and hip hop culture. And of course that makes a lot of sense because of course when hip hop was um, in the 90s, I think, um, he couldn't do too many performances because they were kind of shut down by policing for so many violence. Um, a lot of hip hop artists went to Japan and performed, so their group was kind of very uh, big market uh, for hip hop in Japan. So, um, and he actually talks about that as well. So I think Sanford Biggers would be, if I had to choose one person, um, that would be it. But, you know, there, there's so many people. Uh, there's so many people. And again, not just um, How do you spell that last name? Hammonds? No, Biggin. Biggers. Biggers. He's actually the cousin of John Biggers, who was a um, uh, painter um, in um, Texas. And he's kind of a cousin like my cousin. <laughs> so he's influenced by him as well. And actually, he's also somebody whose work has an Afrofuturist aspect to it because there's a recent body of work that he's done with quilts um, because he's thinking about there's a whole theory of quilts being maps on the Underground Railroad. So he takes that idea and he makes these, he decided that Harriet Tubman is a um, astronaut because she uses the stars to take people to freedom. So he has this whole body of work with his quilts, Harriet Tubman as an astronaut, and you know, so he's thinking about this kind of Afrofuturist uh, space age, going that links us back to uh, 19th century uh, formations as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.